So just a quick um, note on the content. Um, again, as I mentioned, Ian um, is here from the Improvement Service, um, which is a body that um, works with local government across Scotland um, to help them um, build capacity and um, help with their decision-making processes. Um, the, spatial hub, the Spatial Hub is one arm of that, which offers um, one source for Scottish local government spatial data. Um, this data is also available in Digimap's Ordnance Survey Collection. Um, it's freely available to all users. Um, we've had the data in that collection since 2019. So Ian's going to talk to us about the data and some applications, and then I will show you how you can download that data from Digimap. And um, we should have hopefully plenty of time for questions. Can everybody see a presentation slide? Yes. yes. Excellent. That's a good start. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to chat this morning. My name is Ian Payton from the Improvement Service. Uh, I work in the Spatial Hub team and we are responsible, as Viv has said, for local government spatial data. Uh, quick introduction. Uh, local government creates a huge amount of data in the course to living policies and services to citizens. We create a spatial hub to bring spatial data together and publish them to set standards. The idea being to take away the burden of data collection from everybody else so they can get on with more fun things like using the data. We have 44 data sets at the moment. Uh, these have been made ac available to academia via Digimap and these cover various themes such as environment, health, pollution, planning, society and transport. The data sets can be used by academia for any research interests, uh, such as looking at the nature of the planning system in Scotland, how local authorities protect land through designations, or how they provide citizens uh, with services. So that's a summary of uh, what we do via the Spatial Hub. In terms of this presentation, I'll talk a bit more about what we do at the Improvement Service with a focus on data. I'll talk about what we have in terms of Spatial Hub data, how we get it, how it's supplied, and have some examples of how it's used in digital planning and infrastructure planning. If you have any questions, as mentioned, please feel free to use the chat function. And because I'm not very good at uh, doing two things at once, I'll try and answer these at the end. So in terms of the improvement service, uh, we have uh, four main arms. Uh, we have a corporate and business services arm, which supports the other three. And the other three are digital public services, transformation, performance and improvement, uh, and data and intelligence. The data and intelligence is my team, uh, I'm part of that. And the overall aim of the improvement service is to provide leadership to local government with a focus on improvement and transformation. We look at delivering capability and capacity and national level improvement programs. So we're trying to do things at a national level for the 32 councils. We have a particular focus on research, data and intelligence and associated applications and technology platforms and we also have a wider role in brokering resources from out with the local government sector to support delivery or priorities so we do do a lot of talking to various people in various sectors a bit of a focus on the data intelligence team now uh, the improvement service as an organization has around 70 members of staff and the data and intelligence team is a team of 16 we have a spatial data role that has been around since uh, before 2014 and also a wider data and research role and we came together over the last year or so uh, these two particular teams uh, data research and spatial to form a joint data and intelligence team which is under my boss uh, Ian Mackay. Some of the jobs we do, uh, we look at street and address gazetteers, we also host the spatial hub and the data uh, in terms of wider data and intelligence, uh, we publish local government benchmarking framework, uh, look at community planning outcome profiling. We supported the COVID-19 economic impact dashboard and we do a lot of general research and evaluation work. So data and spatial data is pretty much at the center of what our team does. Some of the other products we look at are sub-area population projections, so below the uh, standard areas, uh, and also uh, we have a data hub that we use for address matching and cleaning. So we do quite a lot focused on local government data, and we have quite, uh, quite a few collaborations as well. The Spatial Hub has around 44 data sets and there's a list here on the left I, I, I won't dwell on these in any detail other than the planning ones uh, but we, we do cover many aspects of 
local government data. The model we have is based on the One Scotland Gazetteer, which has a simpler structure based on uh, addresses and streets. And this predates the Spatial Hub. Uh, the Spatial Hub was set up in 2014, uh, and uh, the Gazetteer predates that by some time. But the model of a Gazetteer, where data sets are uploaded by 32 councils to a common theme and then published centrally, is the one we followed in building the Spatial Hub. In terms of data set usage, the bar chart at the bottom shows uh, a data set requests um, and downloads since the start of 2018 to 2020. And uh, what's no noticeable from that chart is that usage has grown, but it's been the usage of open data sets that has grown. So the data sets that you would use from within Digimap will uh, be either open or not open, but the standard user uh, with any of the uh, licensing agreements such as Digimap or the uh, public sector geospatial agreement, uh, the standard public user will be limited to open data sets. But what that slide shows is if you make data open, it, the, the usage increases hugely. And the in terms of supporting infrastructure, we have a web page, which will be a demonstration of later. Uh, this web page allows registered users, which are typically local authorities, to upload their data in uh, spreadsheet, CSV, shapefile, GI, uh, various GIS formats, to upload these via CCAN uh, interface to a Windows environment. The data is then sent to another virtual, a second virtual machine uh, using Linux, and it's in PostGIS format there, and we do quite a bit of data cleaning and standardization using the ETL engine FME, which you may or may not be familiar with. I'm happy to share details of that at the end. And I've got a slide that shows some of the processing we do. And then once the data has been processed, it is then sent to another Postgres table and out to Windows uh, virtual machine and it's shared via GeoServer where you can uh, then get the data at the other end of the process. So we have two virtual machines, two environments. We use Postgres for hosting the data and FME for data cleaning. And this all sits on the CCAN and GeoServer environment for upload management and sharing. I mentioned the growth of the Spatial Hub data sets earlier, and uh, here's a, an example of the top 10 data sets we have. You'll notice that the blue ones are open data, and these are by far the most popular. And uh, at the bottom of the chart there, polling places and polling districts were particularly in demand. That's not surprising given the number of elections in recent years. Uh, below those uh, on the chart, community council boundaries, which we've been publishing for some time, also local authority boundaries, which we provide a, a version of that for download and use via web services based on, I think it's the online survey boundary line product. Above the blue, there's a lot of red there. Uh, these are not open data sets, which you will have access to via uh, Digimap. And these include coal paths, local landscape areas, local development plans, local nature conservation sites, vacant and direct land, and planning applications. Uh, some of these data sets have quite a bit of use potential, particularly local development plans and planning applications. And we're keen to see these used more widely, but we are conscious that there is an issue with these in terms of the currency of the data and also the quality of the data in terms of attribute and schema completeness and it's something we're working on and this is a very good time to be working on it as well for reasons i'll shortly describe so a bit more detail in terms of the data supply and conflation we take data from 32 councils and also two national parks as I mentioned, these are uploaded into a virtual CCAN environment uh, by registered users. And the CCAN environment allows data registration and management downstream. And this also supports the processing via FME, where we conflate the data into a single schema postures. Associated with this are various uh, processes regarding data standards and management and the FME process allows uh, output in terms of uh, tables that show where there's been any uh, data errors so there's a quality assurance uh, element to this as well and 
as mentioned, we public, publish via GeoServer and each of these uh, national layers will uh, support a specific theme. So we have 34 data sets going into one theme, one layer. And we supply these in terms of uh, open data, which is accessible to everybody, uh, authorization key for registered users. And also this is available as a web service or as download in various formats. Uh, in parallel to this, we're looking at API-based processes to support the gathering of uh, planning casework data and gazetteer data. Both of these are uh, uploaded at the moment, but by using data best, database technology at the council end and API type technology, we can get the data straight in without the need for any manual upload. And this is the kind of process we're keen to see develop in future, particularly as more councils share their data directly via web services and portals and so on. As I mentioned earlier, so although we have some challenges at the moment with data quality and completeness, it's a very good time to be doing this because of the growth of geospatial data and uh, also wider data science and data analytics. So there's a lot been going on over the last few years, particularly with the UK Government Geospatial Commission, uh, the launch of the UK Geospatial Strategy, some discipline-specific initiatives, such as a review of the planning and housing landscape, which complements a lot of what we are doing. And also, this week earlier, the launch of Location Data Scotland, which is an initiative to support the development of Scotland's geospatial community. So this is a great time to be working in what we are doing in terms of trying to gather, improve and share the data, because everybody wants it. This is a deeper dive into some of the use cases for our data and digital planning is one initiative that you may have heard of it has quite a high profile with the scottish government and there was the launch of a video this week which i don't have a link to at the moment but i can share it in the chat later and the digital planning and digital transformation program uh, supports the Scottish government planning reform with a view to delivering a digital led planning system. And unsurprisingly, this is entirely dependent on data, largely spatial data. And because planning is a local government function, the bulk of this data comes from the local government environment. And a bit of a deeper dive uh, within this theme is the Assembly of Planning Policy Information, which is uh, a title used to describe the modelling, the infrastructure modelling of past and planned development. Both Scottish Water and Transport Scotland undertake this programme on a two year basis. They send spreadsheets out to councils to request what uh, planning data is held in terms of uh, past development and also planned development via local development plans and uh, land supplies. And this is used in a complex spreadsheet modelling process to assess the need for future infrastructure investment. And this is the example I'll focus on for the rest of the presentation. And the data sets that are relevant to the assess assembly of planning policy information process are planning applications, i.e. where councils have permitted development to happen, local development plans, which councils and uh, other planning authorities prepare to allocate development land in advance of development, and then sitting somewhere between these are annual housing and employment land supplies, where councils are required to assess the land supply and survey this to provide evidence that there's adequate land for development. Otherwise, it can open up uh, grounds for uh, planning appeals and legal challenges to get sites through the system where these might not otherwise be permitted. The housing land supply, uh, subject of a statutory requirement to evidence uh, five-year land supply. The employment land supply is not subject to such a requirement, but it does provide a useful evidence base for uh, the local development plan in particular. So as well as the uh, digital planning initiative, this was supported by a couple of pathfinders, planning pathfinders that the Improvement Service and other organisations such as British Geological Survey undertook. In 2020, there was a focus on data quality and standards, data quality standards and governance in support of the digital planning strategy, which was, uh, it was published last year and launched this week. So that was perhaps more of a retrospective look at what was out there building on the data we hold and uh, how this is governed and the applicable standards. And this has been used to inform the digital planning strategy. 
but there's uh, an awareness this year that uh, we need to start implementing this. So we're about to undertake a second planning pathfinder with the Scottish Government, which will look at implementing these data standards, quality and governance in, a, in the basis of what we might call a, a data ecosystem. So we can understand the data, work to a common standard, manage the data and then help others build insights from the data. And the digital planning strategy has five missions there. And the mission that we are focusing on is really mission one, unlocking the value of planning data, because there are other partners out there who are very good at uh, developing digital technologies and so on. And the data ecosystem I mentioned earlier looks at the systems that contain data, the technical systems, uh, also the wider processes around the data, such as standards, governance, management, developing and maintaining the skills of those who create the data, and also providing guidance regarding what the data is created for and what uh, the data can be used for. And this is all focused on the data itself, which requires the application of standards, et cetera. So it is the, uh, it is the appropriate quality for the intended use. So it's not just about the data. It's not even about the data and the metadata. There's a lot we need to build outwards in terms of a, a data ecosystem that looks at wider considerations that ensures the data is fit for the various purposes. Uh, and that's one of the approaches we'll be using to address some of the data gaps that we have in our own data sets. So looking in a bit more detail at the assembly and planning policy information I mentioned earlier, this is the uh, strategic modelling undertaken by Transport Scotland and Scottish Water. Uh, I, I like using FME a lot, but uh, with a lot of data processing and analysis, it's easy to go straight into the work. But in this case, what I have on the left is a bit of a breakdown of what we actually want to do in this process. And I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer there, but uh, we develop a methodology for this that looks at the cat categories of developments at the top. So most land is residential, most land in the planning system. Uh, but there's also a need to look at non-residential land, such as retail, business, industry and leisure. And as part of this methodology, we need to uh, devise a minimum uh, schema of attributes which look at site name, the site reference, the site address, uh, planning or plan reference, so we can hang on other data later on. And also a quantity development which looks at the development capacity in terms of the units that can be accommodated on the site, uh, also start date when development will have started and the build rate so we can forecast forward. And that's really a minimum minimum schema we look at, but we want to do better that than that and build a fuller schema, which would look uh, at whether the site was greenfield or brownfield, any constraints there such as market constraints of infrastructure that might prevent development uh, and so on then. And some of these, uh, land uses will have different quantities of development so in residential development for example we talk about housing units not business industry and leisure it's typically uh, uh, meters squared or hectares that we look at so on the left there is what we uh, developed as a methodology for uh, assembling and categorizing the data and yeah as, I, as i've shown there it's uh, the types of development maybe a residential retail business industry, leisure, education, health, because these all have different uh, infrastructure requirements. And so the attributes, uh, we're looking at the ge geometry, site information, site size, and uh, in terms of supporting quantitative analysis, we need to know the capacity, uh, past development, and also future phasing of development. Uh, at the outset of the process, uh, this is about a year ago, about a year ago we started discussing this, uh, we realised that we have some data, Scottish Water and Transport Scotland have some data, so we did a rather basic spatial overlay to uh, see if our data, which is shown as polygons, matched their data which is shown as points. And uh, this is a static slide, I didn't really want to start zooming around in and out and queue just in case it broke, but uh, please uh, take it from this side that we found enough of our spatial correlation to show that the data we held largely matched the data they held in the future. And so at least spatially, uh, we have the same data sets. So the, the, the challenge then becomes ensuring that we have the attribution and the quantitative data that they uh, require in Transport Scotland and Scotch Water for their uh, quantitative modelling. Uh, this shows 
the schema for housing land, which is probably the main data set we rely on for this. Uh, one of the challenges we have in terms of schema coverage is the data that's been uploaded to the spatial hub in the past is often spatial only and we lack the tabular data we, we lack a lot of the attribution and we really need the capacity of a site the completions to date on the site uh, the remaining capacity on the site and future phasing for quantitative analysis so there are gaps there in the data but thankfully we're confident that we can fill this by requesting the uh, spreadsheet and the uh, csv data and just doing straightforward uh, join by site reference to fill these data gaps that exist at the moment uh, the way we do this is using fme uh, with uh, the layers that are supplied via the spatial hub process so some of the uh, some of the data sets are pre-categorized so for local development plan for example it's quite straightforward to categorize the local development plan by the uh, the type of land use and others tend to fall into clear categories so if we're getting housing land data set for example uh we know it's housing land uh employment land is a bit vaguer uh it will be usually categorized uh, we can usually do some sort of lookup or mapping uh, within the process to uh say what is what within the employment land layer whether it's uh retail uh, office etc but planning applications is probably where it's very less straightforward because you have 32 councils they have 32 different ways of categorizing planning applications and we have to do quite a bit of uh, attribute mapping and uh, regular expression string searching uh, in the uh, the FME process for planning applications and the diagram there on the right shows some of the, the interactions we're looking at in terms of uh, developing a common schema in the first instance, but then relating land supplies and planning applications and the LDP spatially, and then also uh, doing lookups to see if we can do more fi uh, fine-tuned categorization so that we're getting a, a single data set that says exactly what it is uh, for each feature. And uh, the spatial relationships, which I showed earlier, is probably the most straightforward part because uh, the input to the process would be the local development plan sites at the start, uh, because these are the baseline, if you like, for what's planned over five, ten years of development. And then we'd augment this information with uh, the housing land data set, which is probably the one we rely on the most because most uh, this is the most well-defined data set and it has the most quantitative information and housing land is the, the predominant land use. Uh, then we would augment it with employment land information and try and build a picture uh, to show where we have local development plan sites within these where we've had housing land and employment land allocations uh, and uh, also a pattern of the, uh, the past activity in future phasing. Then we throw planning applications in uh, to try and provide another level of detail and also to fill gaps uh, with housing and employment land allocations and sites because a lot, a lot of development is speculative of windfall development so by throwing these together uh spatially uh we can build up a spatial picture of uh land development across scotland and that's a snapshot from fme which i don't want to dwell on too much but basically uh the spatial relation the spatial relator transformer allows us to mash up this data spatially and to test for relationships where there's uh, an intersection of this data and to look at where uh at uh, LDP level, we can build up the picture using the other data sets, uh, or we can see where there are duplications and eliminate these. Uh, the attribution, the data itself becomes more complex in terms of categorization, and this is a uh, another FME example. I don't want to go into too, too much detail, but basically what we do is uh, for planning applications, for example, we will read in a spreadsheet which provides a number of terms used commonly in planning descriptions. And the example here shows various procedural terms such as change of use, uh, use change variation, section 75. And we're not interested in these because these don't relate to land supplies. These are procedural uh, planning applications. So by using regular expressions and string searches, uh, we can build in a regular expression list or, or rather a list for uh, use in a regular expression and then uh, pass planning application features through this process and strip out those that are procedurally related and then focus in more detail on uh, pulling out and categorizing those features, uh, planning applications that are directly related to uh, housing and employment and the other land uses. 
Uh, in terms of the outputs of this process, I showed you earlier a uh, spatial uh, demonstration that, that they showed spatially there is an overlap uh, between our data sets and what Scottish Water have collected in the past. Uh, this is what we get in terms of uh, planning application data, categorising it, looking uh, for Glasgow. Uh, and the red indicates housing land, uh, the green and the blue indicate uh, business and employment and indus industrial development, and the yellow is retailing. Uh, and there's probably a bit of uh, overlap there in terms of some of the land uses as well, because I mean, Glasgow City Centre, the extent of retailing perhaps isn't well shown there. But when we throw on the land supplies with uh, capacity, we start to get a quantitative picture of the land supply uh, in uh, certainly in, in this case for the centre for, for Glasgow City local authority area. So the numbers do start to tack up uh, to stack up, and then we also get a bit more uh, fine tuning of the um, square meterage uh, hectareage for different land uses such as a uh, retailing business, uh, and then throw on planning applications as well and the picture becomes even more uh more complex and what we are trying to do is provide a simple output from this complex process so that the uh, the infrastructure providers can use this data to then model uh, future land uses based on current capacity and uh, future phasing uh, that's a bit about what we get out of our modelling. Uh, Scotch Water have been kind enough to provide some slides to show how they use the data at their end uh, in terms of infrastructure planning. So they will take their operational boundaries, which relate to investment areas. They'll then put on our housing land supply, uh, polygons in particular uh, at the moment, plus additional information such as uh, the build out rate, the development start date and forecast completions. They then throw in NRS population projections, and we've recently made available the uh, sub-council population projections for uh, 2018. Uh, I'm not sure if these are available via the spatial hub, but you may need to contact the wider data intelligence team for access to this, but uh, I can certainly help in that regard. And then they'll model the growth, uh, forecast growth, each uh, water and waste uh, water operational area level using the data I showed earlier plus uh, current baseline demand and they'll use the data provided to model different scenarios in this case the expected growth operational areas are red so that's where they seek to put in more uh, water pipes uh, etc or infrastructure and uh, that is a process that we're hoping to support through the provision of our data but we're also hoping uh, through data cleaning at various steps that a lot of the steps I showed earlier in future don't become necessary. The data becomes standardized and more usable straight out of the box. So in terms of future developments, uh, we're keen to use the digital planning process, uh, an initiative in particular, to promote data standardization through the idea of a data ecosystem. So the data becomes more consistent at the data source and we move away from the central cleaning that we have to do. Uh, for local development plans, planning applications and land supplies, uh, the digital planning uh, initiative allows us, it gives us the scope to uh, suggest and promote common categorization and enforce this by the use of data standards. So the data eventually will become self-assembling at the regional and national scales where this is needed beyond the local, the immediate local authority environment. Uh, as I mentioned, we're looking to do this through uh, promoting data governance uh, and building, uh, the, providing a data ecosystem, delivering a lot of this through the uh, digital planning initiative, working uh, quite closely with Scottish government partners in this regard, because most of the data, as I mentioned, comes from local government. Uh, and as you saw earlier from the uh, graphs I showed, uh, open data sets are used far more extensively than closed data sets, but open data requires funding. So the uh, this is an issue that does need to be addressed at the national level, the funding of open data. And we're really keen to support innovation uh, at the uh, academic level. So we want to take away the data cleaning burden, both from infrastructure users and also from academics. We want to promote a move away from spreadsheet modeling and a move towards uh, data science techniques such as clustering, classification and regression analysis, and use these data science techniques to provide more sophisticated analysis of uh, future infrastructure requirements and site constraints, for example. So hopefully by us cleaning the data, by making it better, uh, at source and providing it to yourselves we can support a lot of this innovation and 
I think that's the end of my presentation. I've spoken quite a bit, so I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and hand over and answer any questions. That's super, Ian. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm not sure if I've got any questions at the moment. Um, I was really interested to see those maps, you know, the Scottish water, how they overlaid uh, their polygons with uh, the population projections, you know, to sort of plan their future capacity. And I just wondered who are the sort of key users of data from the Spatial Hub? Is it utilities um, companies or are there lots of individuals? I just thought it'd be nice to get a little flavour of who takes your data and the kind of things they do with it. Certainly. I, th I think at the moment, uh, most of the data, other than the ones I've shown, which are open data, uh, which everybody can obviously access. Uh, community council boundaries are quite popular uh, and they they support a web mapping application that, that we do that allows community councils basically to look up uh, where the community council is. So that's probably one reason that's popular. But other than the open data sets, uh, I think a lot of our planning and land information data goes to uh, SE Web. The uh, you you probably be familiar with SE Web. It's a portal for environmental data information. So I think they draw on our data to support uh, the environmental data they provide and provide additional context. Uh, although, as mentioned, uh, I, I don't think our data is quite there yet for local development plans and housing lands. So as we improve the data, make it more usable, I think the use will increase. Yeah. Oh, it certainly sounds like you've got plenty of challenges with you know. Yeah different categorizations and missing attributes and things. So thank you, Ian. Um, we have a question now um, from someone saying, um, I'm a research associate already using a wide range of your data sets. I'd like to know the way I can access the SGN data set. I was told by IS, which I think that might mean information services, that is a bit challenging for academia, or sorry, that must be improvement service. Yeah. Help in this case, thank you in advance. Yeah, I'm not really familiar in detail with that, but I can, I can, I'm not sure if SGN is provided via Digimap, but I'll certainly uh, go away and ask my colleagues and provide a response. Uh, no problem at all. And I've, I've got uh, Irina, Irina's email address there. So, yes, I will look into that for you. Thanks, Ian. And... Uh, we've no more questions at present. One more question I've got, Ian, is: um, Is there any way for um, someone to visualise the data sets that you provide? Um, I don't know, perhaps through a web map, web map service, or any kind of map, or, or is it a case of downloading the data and visualising it in your own software? Uh, we, we have a preview map on the Spatial Hub where, where you can look at it. Uh, but but to, to be honest, we, in the past we've been more about providing the data for others to use, but happy to provide any advice or look at cases for providing data visualizations. Great. But I think what, once once you get the data, uh, that's that's a hard part over. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, well prior to cleaning it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, super. Well, thank you, Ian. So um, while we wait for any more questions to come through, I'm just going to quickly share um, a couple of slides to show people where they can find this data within um, Digimap collections. So hopefully someone can uh, confirm that they can see some PowerPoint. Yeah, you can see that fine, Viv, that's great. Thank you, Ian. Okay, so um, yeah, just to um, clarify where you can find the data that Ian's been talking about in Digimap collections, um, it's within the Ordnance Survey collection. So you would select Ordnance Survey and then uh, select the data download application that I'm circling there. And then once you're in the data download, um, it's a, simply a case of selecting the Improvement Service Scotland category. Um, you don't need to select a particular area um, because for every data set you, down, you choose to download, you'll get Scotland coverage for, for all of them. So I've just um, circled in red there, you know, it's just a little excerpt of the, some of the data sets that are available. As Ian mentioned, there's 44 data sets. Um, so you simply check the boxes next to the ones you require, select the Add to Basket button. Um, before I move on from this slide, I've said here, if you don't see Improvement Service Scotland, you need to either talk to us or talk to the Digimap contact at your institution. Um, when your institution um, purchases Digimap Ordnance Survey, they sign a licence agreement. 
but there is an additional license agreement to cover the Improvement Service Scotland data. And so if you don't see it, um, it's likely to be the case that they haven't signed that license. So that's a very simple process. If you don't know who to talk to at your institution, talk to us, our help desk, and we can help you resolve that. So once you've chosen your data sets and said add to basket, um, then your basket pops up and it's, um, there are not so many options for these particular data sets, but you may have some date options. So for example, on this one, I've selected the air quality management areas. There's a little drop down there and there's two different um, date versions available. Um, but that's likely to be the main option that you'll have on these data sets. Um, you can see in the format column there, they're provided in shape format, which is compatible with the right, a wide range of different software. And um, once you've selected the date options, you can choose to name it if you wish. I've just called it local government data here. And then it's just a simple matter of saying request download. And um, then you get a couple of emails from us, one to confirm the order and um, the next with your download link. And um, the downloads don't tend to take very long to process. Um, we aim to do them. Our, our sort of standard is within two days, but the vast majority are provided far, far quicker than that. So that was just to let you know where you can get that data. So over to you guys um, for any, any further questions. Ian, I can't see the chat right now. So if there's anything in there, um, no, there's nothing there at the moment. I was I had a question actually for, for Ian. Um, what's the sort of update frequency of the data that you provide? Is it annual or is it every couple of years? How often do they get updated? It, it depends on the data set. Uh, planning applications are updated uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, that will change over the next uh, year or so as we move to uh, a more real-time update using the uh, the API. Uh, approach I mentioned earlier, but they, they're probably the most frequently one. Uh, yeah, planning applications and building standards. Uh, the other ones, we, 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 we did have a quarterly update cycle, and we still use that to some uh, some extent, but that, that, that was quite arbitrary. Uh, and I think what's happening is we're, we're moving away from that quarterly process and either getting in sync with the data set update frequency, uh, so more, more real time. So local development plans, for example, they might be updated. Uh, it's a five to 10 year plan. So uh, five to 10 years across 32 authorities means you may get a few updates of LDPs a year. So yeah. that may well fit a quarterly cycle. Uh, and other ones, uh, some of them don't change very often, such as green belts. So again, that's a refit within a quarterly cycle. Uh, and other ones change rather randomly. So I think we're going to move away from the quarterly process to more uh, reactive. Yeah, well, at the moment, I, I, yeah, at the moment we tend to chase councils. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's almost as if we're going from quarterly to a proactive approach, and then yeah. I think eventually, eventually, it'd be a reactive approach. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you take local development plans, for example, about half of councils at the moment will publish uh, their LDPs on ArcGIS Online, which is great. The data is online already, uh, yeah. but only really for viewing. So if they provide an API at their end, then the data can be consumed directly, uh, which makes up, makes us uh, make, makes it very responsive. Uh, and also, some councils provide data via web services, uh, web, fe web, web feature service or REST API, for example. So again, we're getting the, the data straight for them, from them. But that does require the council to update, the, uh, ensure that the web service they're using is sharing the most recent data, uh, which yeah. is, yeah, some, something we, you can tend to take for granted. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I think it's a yeah. tremendous job you do combining the data of all the different local authorities. So it's a fantastic resource that's available. I, I got to admit, though, I think eventually we our jobs will go away, uh, or, or hopefully anyway, because if you have half the councils publishing their LDPs online, uh, once they start publishing to a common standard uh, for that data set, then with common attribution, and no, nobody really needs to match it up in the middle. Uh, <laughs> But by that, that stage, uh, we don't mind because we, 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 we then move on to doing stuff with the data rather than collecting it. Yeah, so, sure, yeah, sure. It, it, it's a, a, a sort of ladder, of pro, an escalator of progress or something like that. And then we can get more into the visualization in, in the analyses. And I'm really interested in the scope for the application of data science to uh, take some of these data sets to ditch the old spreadsheet models uh, and, and then use more sophisticated techniques. I think, I think the whole planning system is interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, that's interesting. 
And Viv, somebody's uh, used asked if they'd be able to have the slides. Is that something that we'll post out afterwards? Or? Um, well, that's really up to, to Ian if he's happy. Yeah, to... absolutely. Okay, yep. that'd be great. Thank you, Ian. And the, the digital planning initiative, Ian, um, is that the improvement service that are really driving that to try and get the, the data standardised? And uh, we've, It's a, a Scottish government in, in initiative and it's quite high profile. Uh, digital transformation has been around for quite a while. Uh, I think the Planning Act, because I, I'm, I'm also a town planner by background as well as a, as a data person, uh, the, the, the Planning Act was updated in 2019. There was a new Planning Act published and alongside that we were quite... Uh, ambitious digital aspirations uh i think as is common across many sectors everything's digital but the the focus in the last couple of years has moved more onto data uh thankfully because data underpins digital and i think i think the scottish government sees us as key delivery partners because most of the uh data they acquire comes from councils we provide data for councils so we've had over the last couple of years we had really good dialogue with the Scottish Government and working through these couple of pathfinders and what they're doing is great for us because if they can change the policy and the legislation it makes us easier it makes it easier for us to insist on standards. Yeah okay well thank you very much um, to Ian huge thanks to you that was really fascinating to hear more about yeah. the work that you guys are doing and your future plans. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me um, I will send a recording um, to everyone that will be um, into early next week and Ian's slides as well. And if people do have any further questions, they can always contact the digimap at ed.ac.uk and then um, we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. But many thanks to Ian and everyone for coming along. Thank you.